I'm Janet Jacobson. I'm director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women and professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies here at Barnard. Um, and um, I have a very pleasurable job, uh, which is to do uh, three very brief things. One is to say how wonderful it has been to have Lama here at Barnard College and to participate with her in the various projects associated with her work as the Social Fel Justice Fellow um, at Barnard for this year. Um, and the second is to orient you a little to how the day is going to continue, given that we're running a little late. Um, uh, but fortunately, we had built in some time in case this uh, happened, because we knew that the conversations would be extremely engaging, as they have been already this morning. Uh, this panel is African Men and Feminisms, and the last panel will be intergenerational organizing uh, with Lema and several young activists who are doing important work. Um, then finally, there will be a closing reception, and we invite all of you to stay, continue the conversations informally, and enjoy a celebration of what I'm sure is going to continue to be a very successful day. And my final job is to introduce our moderator and panelists for today. They've asked that I go very short with the introductions, and you can find these on um, the Bernard Center for Research on Women website if you want to read more about it. We always encourage people to read more about it. Um, so I will be uh, as brief as possible while orienting you to um, the wonderful speakers who have agreed to be with us for this second panel. First of all, our moderator is Abina Busia, who is um, professor and the current chair of the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. Um, and our good colleagues. She is co-director and co-editor of the groundbreaking Women Writing Africa Project, which is a multi-volume anthology published by the Fem Feminist Press at CUNY. And she's also the associate editor of um, two other important vo volumes, Women Writing Africa, West Africa and the Sahel, and Women Writing Africa, Northern Africa. She's a poet and a scholar um, and has made many contributions. And she also does important ongoing work in Ghana. Um, there are many projects. She asked me to pick out just one, um, which is that she has directed a summer internship taking undergraduates to work with women's rights organizations in Ghana for the past seven years. Um, and she serves on a number of advisory boards and is the current board chair of AWF US a, which is a sister organization to the African Women's Development Fund, um, the first and only pan-African funding source for women-centered programs and organizations. And Professor Busia will be our moderator for this panel. Um, and then um, a couple of our panelists have said, say the shortest thing possible. So Samuel G. Doe, Samuel Bede Doe, is um, with UNDP um, and has a long uh, history of doing uh, peace building work throughout uh, West Africa and is, um, uh, uh, holds many degrees in peace building and conflict studies. Um, uh, Kennedy Odede um, is uh, one of the best known community organizers and social entrepreneurs. Um, and he grew up in the Kibera slum, which is the largest slum in Africa. And from his childhood there, developed a grassroots organization called Shining Hope Communities. And out of this work, he has won any number of awards. Uh, he had I already cut like 75 of them. So just be assured that the work has received important recognition um, and that we're very happy to have him here today. And then finally, Mohamed Yahya, and he too works with UNDP. Both uh, Mr. Doe and Mr. Yahya said, just say UNDP, and that's enough. So we're very happy to have them here, and I'll turn it over to Abina. Thank you. I'd like to thank um, the wonderful Lema Bowe and the women of Barnard for this invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here. A little daunted to be chairing this particular panel, <laughs> but I will do my best. And um, so I would like to begin by asking these three men, as African men, how indeed do they respond to the very term feminisms? And not only as professional UNDP, types, but also at home, in their domestic and private lives. And um, I know in this context that the professional one is probably an easier question than the personal one, but we can't escape the personal is also political. I would like them to address that term and its meanings 
from all perspectives that they can think of, including the personal. Right. Thank you, uh, right. Madam Moderator. And I'm pleased to be here uh, to join this really interesting conversation. I'd like to first emphasize here that I think all of us here are quite nervous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and please take it easy with us. <laughs> so, that's, that's my first caveat. And, and the second caveat is it's quite uh, daunting to represent African men. Uh, because I think, uh, quite frankly, even African women and African men are not homogenous terms. Uh, even if you come to talk about masculinity or femininity. So we, we like to emphasize that. And that's what I, I really appreciate the moderator's uh, suggestion that we speak personally on, on this issue. The second uh, thing that I like to emphasize in, in terms of me personally is that I think I have been to some extent a lucky guy when it comes to the conversation uh, between femininity and masculinity. Uh, for, for two reasons, uh, two main reasons. One is that uh, I'm, a, I'm the fourth of eight children, and the first three children are girls, and the fifth is a girl. And so I was bullied by girls <laughs> uh, growing up. But uh, through that space, that personal, private space, I learned early on that I didn't have to see a girl or see a boy. I saw my sisters and I saw my brothers. I saw persons. I saw humanity at the very beginning. So that, uh, over time, had an influence on how I characterize these two big boxes that are now burdened to all of us. The second is that I, I come from the coastal area of, uh, of West Africa. And uh, there along the coast is an, is an ethnic group that is called the crew. And for those of you who know West Africa, the crew are the decentralized, highly decentralized, stateless people who don't have comfort in any uh, hegemony or any uh, form of hierarchy. And, and so we have decentralized systems. We have female chiefs. We just make a lot of noise. We are very rowdy people. Uh, and so based on that system from which I originated, my focus, my perspective of masculinity or femininity is a bit different. And the point I want to make here is that uh, here we should spend a bit more time talking about the drivers, the origin of these two big boxes that we find ourselves in today. They are a product or a determinant of socialization, how we are brought up. Who brings us up? What system we grew up in? And who manages those systems? And so if you look at it from a socialization orientation, then probably we all need to see uh, various things. And this is what I, I, I thought the, the conversation here and the theme of, of this meeting, rights and resilience, should really be at the focus of, of, of our discussion. Resilience, as Lehman had emphasized, is intentional action taken by people who see that there is a problem and they want to address the problem. Rice, of course, and uh, Amina spoke a lot about that, entitlement, all of those uh, things that we know about, how we frame rice in this whole conversation uh, between the two sexes, we need to be uh, taken seriously. But agency and sustainability are those forces that I have seen personally growing up and having, having sisters. Intentional action, and sustaining uh, uh, those, those actions. So I'll, I'll come back to those, but I just want to emphasize my orientation towards femininity is from that background. Coming to the public space, working as a, as a, as a civic actor in, in West Africa, I came to the realization that in the public sphere, there's a different definition of how they interact or how men and women interact. I realized that in the public space, I had more advantage than my sisters in the public space. I had more voice. I could be allowed to speak in public meeting uh, outside of the home, although they had a louder voice uh, uh, at home. And so that private public distinction became real to me. And it was important for us to now begin to think, how do we cultivate, how do we foster 
that other voice that is not being heard. And I'll, I'll come back to that in the story of, of OneNet and, and other places that I've worked. So I want to be really honest here. And women, don't beat me, okay? So growing up, I was really so funny that it's become a little bit, a little bit with the system. You know, you don't understand why. And men should not do this work. And women are not respected. And it's become like in my community. Growing up was really, really, really kind of normal. We're going to play soccer? No, you're a girl. Don't join us. You know what I mean? And it become like no questioning about it. And we talk about gender issues, we news about white people who were crazy talking about this gender equality, which the community didn't understand. So one thing happened in my life. So in our house, uh, I didn't like washing dishes. So my mother keep on forcing me every time, like, Kennedy, is your turn to wash the dishes. And I'm like, Mom, it is Antoinette. I'm a boy. You know what I mean? And she'll keep on telling me, no, no, in this house, there's no boy, there's no girl. You are all equal. So if I don't wash the dishes yesterday, today is your turn. And then to make that worse, I could be taken outside so other people could see me. And I could be crying. Mom, this is unfair. And, you know, so I learned in a hard way. And doing other jobs that women are supposed to do in my community, kind of, you know. Then later on, through that love of my mom and knowing about feminism, in that kind of way, without understanding the word, it became personal to me because of the love of my mom and then how to start respecting people. So at the beginning, it became like, a, for me, it became what's called human rights. It became like, this is how it should be. People should be equal. So we girls also should play soccer. So I started changing my mind, through, according to, through my mom. Then something happened, in short, is that I got a scholarship to, the, to Wesleyan University. That's the time I was able now to discuss feminism and to be able to understand, you know what I mean? So I think I was, I was understanding it before in the Kibera, but without understanding the word. So therefore, for me, it's really, it is a, now I can say everybody should be equal. It's more about economical, you know, social, economical, political space. They want that, you know what I mean? And there is about equality. And nobody should be disrespected, you know what I mean? So that's what I get through it, through the family, and respect to my mom on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I was wondering why Lima wanted me here because first I thought because she, uh, Lima came to uh, uh, UNDP and she's a very close friend of our director. So she, I remember when you came and said that there's a symposium coming and she wants uh, Africans to come to the symposium. And the director said, no problem, we'll send you uh, one of our directors who's an African to come and talk to. And then uh, Lima said, no, no, I don't want... I want younger people to come and talk. And then she told me later, Mohammed, I want you there. But I said, I, I don't work on gender issues. That was my first. Why, why am I going there? Uh, and then later, she, uh, uh, when I was chatting with you, she said, exactly, because you don't do gender issues. That's why I want you there. So in, in a sense, I'm here because it relates to the question that has been asked. For me, the concept of feminism it was, is something that came uh, later on in my life. And uh, it's not something that I have really thought about uh, uh, in, more, more in, in my daily life for a very, very long time. And that's why I think that this is what happens to many young African men as they grow up. Privilege is something sometimes you're unconscious of. You don't know because you're privileged. Uh, you, I can't associate uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the disc daily discrimination women go through. Uh, as a young person when I was growing up, I'm not young anymore, you can see all my gray hair, but when I was, I was much younger, I never associated that precisely because it's not something that affected me. Why should I join uh, a, pros, uh, a, 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 a group of people who I don't even understand what the, the issues that they're campaigning about is? In a sense, society had made inequality and discrimination acceptable, the norm. What, how many people will go out of that process to challenge uh, 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 a societal uh, system? Uh, this is a, it's a huge risk for many people. And those who are privileged like us, young men, uh, we didn't see no reason why we should even engage in this process. I remember when I went to, um, then my, of course, I, as I grew, I grew older, I, uh, these issues came back to me, and it, uh, I was, uh, uh, as I went to university, the, the more exposure I got, the more I got out of, of my own society and my own group, uh, these issues became more prominent, and, 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 and I, was, I was, in a, in a sense, able to engage. 
But I remember I, I went to Afghanistan for the UN. I was working there, and I used to get emails from my friends. And they would ask me, Mohammed, do you know how it is to be a, wom a woman in Afghanistan? My answer was, I don't know how it is to be a woman anywhere. <laughs> I, I don't. Um, uh, and, uh, and in a sense, the concept of feminism uh, for me, when, uh, uh, if I put myself as uh, 10, 15 years ago, is very different from what it is now. 10, 15 years ago, when the concept of feminism came across to me, it was something quite alien, something that has nothing to do with me, something uh, that I should not engage. Later, uh, understanding privilege, understanding the ignorance of privilege, understanding that uh, uh, the, the, a society whereby women are, de are deprived of basic rights is not a society that will be stable in the long run or is not a society that will progress. I, I, I'm a strong believer, and I think my colleagues have touched on it. I have never seen a society that fully, of course the levels of freedom, uh, freedoms are different, but I've never seen a society that fully discriminates women and prospers. It's like saying 50 to 51% of your, of your population are made uh, are, are discriminated and not, not contributing directly to the political life or economic life of a country. That, that is just not, at, at, and, uh, is not attainable in terms of progress itself. So I wanna, you asked us about our personal uh, uh, experience. I, I wanted to give an experience. When I was, I remember, uh, I'm, I'm Somali. Um, I came to Kenya very young as a, as a, as a, as a refugee, then I went to, uh, to England to study m much later. But I remember when we were young, uh, every time, at home, there was an issue of my father being able to pay fees at school. They all, we, we, the, the boys were always prioritized. He would say, okay, now, I, this month we don't have enough money. Uh, Mohammed, you, your fees will be paid. Uh, Liban, your fees will be paid. The girls will wait for a few more months until, until uh, money comes through. But the interesting thing is, my sisters did not see it as discrimination because they've been conditioned uh, to think at a very young age that education is actually something that men should have initially for any family, it's something that men should, pri should be prioritized to have. And uh, much later, I didn't think about it, for, it was just normal. Uh, the boy get, goes to go to, gets to go to school, the girl gets to go to school when there's abundance. But much later, I remember uh, my sister now is a very successful uh, woman, so when we talk, when we meet, once a year, uh, uh, she lives in Italy. Whenever we meet once a year, we discuss this issue. And, uh, and it's, it's, we have a very different perspective after today. I mean, when we discuss it, how we see it, um, it's not something that people are conscious of. So in a sense, uh, what I'm trying to say in terms of relation, my own relationship with feminism is, is, is something that was alien to me for a very long time. But it's something that I, I benefited personally from discrimination, in a sense because I was sent to school and someone was deprived of it. And it's something that I think in the long run, uh, to create the balance and the e equality that feminism seeks, is, is the need to understand or to awaken that ignorant privilege. Uh, so that's my, my contribution. Thank you. Thank, thank you, and um, thank you very much for your honesty in that last answer. Because for many of us, it is the awakening consciousness of your last answer that we do not get amongst the men we are intimate with, whether our brothers, our husbands, or lovers, or what have you, that becomes so hugely frustrating. And I want, actually, at this moment, therefore, we promised the last the gentleman who asked the question at the end of the last panel, that his issue would be addressed in this one. And in the light of what you have, you, Mohammed, have just said, before you answer what I think he thinks is the substance of his question, I wonder if you could address yourselves to the fact that he asked the question in the way he did in this forum. I, I, Sorry. I think, I think it's, uh, to be fair, uh, Madam Moderator, I think he's, he's an adult. <laughs> he can't uh, 
have his day in court, but uh, yeah, the, the point that Mohammed made that not being conscious of maybe the privileges we have because of our sexes or because of where we're born, because of the space we inherit, uh, that lack of awareness and that being trapped in a system that uh, produces that sort of divide and exclusion, uh, to a larger extent, maybe listening to what the brother said will suggest that whether Mohammed was, you know, had the privilege of going to school and his sisters did not, uh, in the long run, the system effect, the effect on the larger society will also affect Mohammed, it will also affect men and, and boys. So all of us, in that ignorance of system burden, there are shackles that we are carrying, shackles of ignorance, uh, shackles of divide, shackles of not understanding and appreciating the fullness of humanity across the sexes. So I, from that context, I think that concept of slavery that has been talked about can be projected on all societies where these systems are still perpetuating themselves. That's, that's the extent I can go with what I, I think he, he was attempting to say. That, and, and so men need to also have the reflection that uh, Mohammed and others who have had that uh, disadvantage of growing up in that divide to have with themselves growing up or realizing and then taking intentional steps beyond the privilege they, they have had. No, uh, maybe this will be difficult to say, but I, I always said, you know, I grew up in a slum in, in, in West Africa, in Liberia, in West Point. And in that slum, if you came out and, you, and, were, you know, and I started school quite late, so going to school and in interacting with people who came from Payne Avenue, the layman living in Payne Avenue and the privileged ones. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there was always that divide, you know, you guys are from West Point. And I, I remember there was this colleague of mine who also came from Payne Avenue, and two of us saw this. I was a, a student leader for the public schools across the, across the country. So there was this girl who, uh, we all, both of us fell in love and I'm trying to engage. And, and my friend, uh, in the middle of the last crowd, and said, uh, do you know where that guy is from? She said, no, I don't know where he's from. He's from West Point. She said, what, West Point? <laughs> And I, and, but then she said one thing, it doesn't matter that he is from West Point, it will matter most if he remains in West Point. And that's what systems do to us. It doesn't matter that we're born in privileges or, or we're born in wealth. We don't need to be apologetic about that, but we need to be conscious that this, if this privilege undermines, excludes, deprives others in society, what intentional action can I take to move out of my comfort zone, step out of my comfort zone and engage and transform and work towards? And I think that's what Abby Gill has been doing over the, over the years. And I don't think you need to be really apologetic of, being, of growing up in wealth, but you should be apologetic if you remain in that comfort zone and not step out of it. And that's a challenge to men, stepping out of the comfort that we have grown in to break the shackles that is on our legs and on the legs of women. Then I want to ask, and, and um, Kennedy, I'm addressing this question specifically to you. Um, because I was struck when I read your brief bio about the circumstances under which we can take courage to make intentional actions and the, the conditions under which we can do any of it. And I'm referring to your 20 cents and football story. <laughs> um, no, it's important, so I'd like to, you to talk about it, because what struck me about it, which can be an object lesson, I think, for all of us, was you are in a slum. 20 cents is therefore a very big deal. And what the two things you do, a football for girls, what in the world made you do that? Okay. 
that's a good question. So, so what happened maybe to go back a little bit was that I was lucky to get a job in the factory whereby I was earning, I was 17, I was earning one dollar for 10 hours, so I have to walk two hours going to the work, so I cannot use the bus fare because I can't eat anything, you know. So, but what happened to my sister? So a lot of things happened. What happened to my sister was really horrible, you know what I mean? Women being abused, but, you know what I mean? But coming from a family perspective, it was really close to, to my heart. And it was really hard, because being in the slum is about poverty. And where there's poverty, everybody's trying to survive. So whereby, and let's be honest here, men tend to be toward the power in any society, most of the time, yeah? But imagine when you're poor, you can get that job. Who is in trouble? Women. So, so all these men are trying to prove their power by undermining women. So that's something that really, really was dear to me, you know, to see that. And then I realized that the only thing about this is about discussion. So when I came up from the factory job, I bought a soccer ball, and that's already the movement that we founded. And, and honestly, people, people are willing to, to do something into these issues, but there is no understanding. And I remember our first conversation was, who loves their moms? Man, everybody in the room, ah! Their sisters, you know what I mean? Can we protect them? Do we all agree in Kibera that if you go to these informal schools, you will find more boys than girls? And, and, and that's a question we ask ourselves, and it's true. So something's not working here. There's, you know? So why can we fight on this issue? You know what I mean? So I took that courage, and I also spoke to other men in the community and make them buy into the idea. But the problem we are facing this time is about Division, we are not including men in this fight. And I think what makes successful in my small community was when men were made to be aware of their privilege, of what they are doing, and they were like, wow, they are thinking about it. I mean, and then somebody, uh, they, and then somebody like me, they used to call me the, the mayor. Somebody like me who kind of also had a small, small power, but I was a member of a gang, got transformed, not easily, by seeing when we go to demonstrate and burning uh, things down, our people were shot. And realize that you cannot do that way. I mean, and seeing how women in the community are struggling, selling tomatoes, yet men are just chilling, playing games. I mean, I wanted to do something. And it worked because of involving men in the community. So it is not, is a, I, I use the word, it is a Human right issue here. You know what I mean? We, they need, and you have to accept one thing is that, let's accept that men have have it in a better way. If you don't accept that, there's no way we'll go. So I made my community believe that men are ahead. And, there, and, there, and therefore, we have to work on a lot of programs on how to support and work together with our sisters and mothers. Perhaps this is really only a question that arises in a particular class. But I'm going to ask it, and I'm going to ask it because I have friends, a number of the women sitting here who do this real feminist work on the continent, know that many of our sisters who we know are the fiercest feminists out there, do not use the F word because they recognize in their personal lives they cannot afford to be so identified if they're trying to keep their personal relationships with men intact. And so you have women who, in spaces like this, Everybody says, oh, I know that African feminist woman. Yeah, fierce woman. She's done A, B, C, D. Go to her country and use that word, and you're in trouble, and you will end her marriage. You have all articulated a level of consciousness about your personal situations. But now I do want you to stretch and speak for your brothers and unpack that 
issue then. Why, for some of us in heterosexual relationships, that word can become a lethal weapon? I'll, I'll allow um, Sam to speak for the western part of the continent. <laughs> I don't even understand the men there, but uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll speak for, for the eastern side as much as I can. And I have Kennedy, so we're two on that side. Um, See, I'm marginal <laughs> um, First, I, I, I don't think, you see, there's deep, I, I think your question applies to educated African men who fear feminism. I can tell you, the majority of Rural people don't even know what it means. So it's not about, they, they don't fear what they don't know. <laughs> so if, in my, if you go to where, where my community comes from, you go to where nomadic communities, you go to Rome, you talk about feminism, they have no idea what you're talking about. So, but let's, let's uh, uh, put the argument around those who know what feminism is. The interesting, the interesting I always find is, even the diaspora, African, African men in the diaspora, quite educated, have all the accesses, they, they, they have all the opportunities, but they always go home and marry home from the village. And the debate is always, do you want to be married to a woman who's educated and lives in the West? Hell no. <laughs> she's gonna talk back to you, she's gonna tell you, go make the tea yourself. Uh, she's gonna, she, uh, she'll start having opinions all day. Uh, uh, and she's going to lecture you on everything. It's, 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 a, it's something that people fear. And that's the honest truth. I, I think they fear. And this is educated people. So we're not talking about a rural nomad with his camel. He, he has no issue with fear. He has other problems to deal with, where the next food is coming from. or issue like. So feminism is not on his oh, top he's... agenda. But for, for many young men, or even middle-aged men who are who are, have all the privileges, Africans who have access, they've always, have a, they've always had an, a difficult relationship with the, 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 between their thought, if you engage them, they're quite liberal and they're quite open, and their actions, there's a gap. Their actions is always to go back to what is comfortable, what reinforces privilege, what doesn't challenge them, and, and, and you can explain it different ways. I mean, I, I, for me, I think it's also partly something to do uh, uh, with, with not only fear, but insecurity, right? Uh, they, they probably have had a lot of experience uh, being uh, around women who, or they've been engaged or, or had girlfriends of, 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 of the educated women who want uh, to see progress, and they probably are fearful of that. I don't know why, but I, uh, probably Sam can help me a, a lot on, on this front. He, he has more experience on, on, on those fronts. But I've always wondered why, why that is. But also, it's an issue about change. People are scared of change. You know, change, uh, uh, look at this country. I mean, whenever you have to try to pass any legislation or anything to do with any change, people fear. Status quo is always comfortable. The unknown is not comfortable. So that is one issue. The other thing is, I have to say, listening uh, to many people who work on the feminist agenda, sometimes it can get very complex for simple people like me. I, I really don't understand it sometimes. It can get very academic, very uh, complex, and it, is not, you know, maybe it may not be accessible. For many people, feminism means men going down, women taking uh, everything up, women leading. Uh, women dominating. Uh, uh, so for them is why why should I why should I engage in things that will diminish my position? So it's also an issue of self-interest. But again, I think that uh, the issue of uh, I, I would say the PR for feminism hasn't been as good as it ought to be. That's one uh, one one thing. The other thing I will I will mention uh, I, I, will, I will say is how it's explained. I want to give you an example. I, I used to manage a, a program to support the parliament in Afghanistan. And you talk about old-fashioned. I thought, I, thought, I thought we Somalis were a bit old-fashioned. Until I went to Afghanistan and I thought we're the most liberal people <laughs> God has ever probably created. So, and we had programs. We, we, the, the, the UN had programs on, on issues of women leadership. 
and we were, we were going there to tell a place completely dominated by men of old school type that women should have more opportunities, that we should pass more legislations around education, and that they should have... Of course, nobody was listening to us. So it was... They would say, Mohammed, even you? Because my name is Mohammed, so they assume that I'm in their crew. So they say, Mohammed, even you? I expect that from the other dude. The, the, the infidel guy, this is an infidel talk. Even you? So you have this, this kind of uh, barrier you have to have overcome. And the way we try to explain it at the end is, look, you, what, what do you want for your country? And they will always say, oh, we want economic growth, we want opportunities, we want employment, we want... Then, imagine you have a football team, 11 players. You put five of your players or six of your players in the bench. How are you going to win a soccer game with half of your team sitting outside? Then you are facing another team that has full team. So we had to engage on the level of you really cannot marginalize and ensure 50% of your community, uh, your society is uneducated, has no access. How are you going to compete? So we tried to get on the economic side, which make, made sense for, for them much easier than the social justice side. The social justice side was like, ah, we're not going to go there. But the economic side, for some, not all of them, I'm not saying we transformed the place, far from it, but we were able to have more uh, audience by engaging on the social, uh, the, the economic uh, uh, aspect. If I speak for West Africa, I think it's fair. Those of you who've been to Africa, the men in West Africa are far more liberal than the men in East Africa. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. You know that. <laughs> it's a, it's we, a fact. We, we need to have a different panel for this. <laughs> I heard that, right? It's true, right? Yes. Yeah, it's true. That's why, you know, I mean. <laughs> But on a serious note, uh, Mohammed is, is really right, because uh, I think part of this for those of us who are men, and in, let's, let's be, you know, uh, I think Mohammed hit the nail on it. Let's, let's all agree that all systems, that's, an, that's the other fact, all systems resist change. So, uh, if patriarchy or masculinity have been entrenched, it becomes a system embedded in culture, embedded in institutions, provide privilege for one sex against the other. Any attempt to change it, that privileged sex will be anxious about it. And so, there is real fear out there uh, by quite a lot of men, especially from East Africa, that are not... <laughs> that I'm not comfortable with this conversation with, with feminism. But the other point that Mohammed also made is that the word feminism, even among women, if you were to go to the CSW and see some of the rural women that are coming, they really don't understand that word, uh, feminism. They don't use it in their struggle. There's something else. Although whatever they are doing is about feminism, is about agitating, seizing the public space, all of the things that are being done. But there is a disconnect at least in my experience uh, in West Africa, between the well-educated uh, scholar feminist and the grassroots woman who just want to be able to deal with the situation between the men in the villages or the men in Afghanistan. So there is probably the lack of understanding which exacerbates the fear uh, between men. And that's it's our responsibility to educate ourselves, but it's also equally the responsibility of the feminist uh, women uh, to, to also help us in that, to create a space for re-socialization of both men and women around this, around this issue. So that's the second, ignorance, status quo, resistance to change, and that uh, fear that it brings. I just want to share a story, because I had the opportunity of uh, working in West Africa running what many of a few people here know called the West Africa Network for Peace Building, uh, one of which is a regional network. BC and others, uh, Lima, were quite uh, uh, related to that. BC gave us a lot of money from the African Women's Development Fund. But they, when we introduced the idea of bringing WebNet, the Women in Peace Building Network, which was brought by Thelman Ikeyo, another brilliant Nigerian uh, young girl that I met in Uganda. 
at an invitation from another lady, Gay, we had a meeting there, and uh, Thelma had uh, told me and she had had terms of communicating which I did not uh, take at the time. I didn't take seriously. So we, we met, and she said, I have this idea, we want to work with rural women. I've already developed the, the concept note, I've developed the, the proposal and all of that. And then I said, wow, that's the whole vision of OneNap. So you come, you have your space. She made it clear, we are with OneNap, but we need our own space. We do not want to be controlled by the structure of, the, of men of OneNap then. I accepted that. And without consulting with my fellow men in, in the organization, I had agreed with uh, Thelman in Uganda, and I came back, and I called a staff meeting and, and shared with my other colleagues, and there was fear in the room. I said, what? You're bringing these women? You know how those women can behave, those feminist women? And it took a, it took a long time for them. Actually, really, it took a, uh, they did not accept the, the idea. I imposed it, Webner grew, and I think the rest is history. A lot of us know what came out of that web, web day, including the Nobel laureate that we, we have here. But it takes a lot of courage for men to really allow the space they are comfortable in to bring women in. Equally, a lot of feminists make us scared because of the reactionary tendency uh, that you see in, in a lot of uh, strong will uh, feminist women. Every time somebody speaks to uh, my friend here, Kesley, I just do it quickly. They said, Kesley, how are you? Uh, and he said, I'm, and they said, this is uh, Lehman's husband. And then everybody said, what? <laughs> God bless you, my friend. <laughs> 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 so that was inconsistent. So, but it's something that we need to break that fear, and you need to help us as well, so that we can all find that space that humanizes us and humanizes you. You know, thank you for that long answer. <laughs> no, it's, but it's important, and you've all said a number of important things, but I want to get back to, let's set aside the term itself then. When I ask you, these women, those of us women, that you are calling feminists, I want you to do two things. One, what is it that this feminist, and we will not use the F word, this woman is actually doing? What are her aims? What are her objectives? And what is she trying to achieve? And then, once we have unpacked that, are there really no rural women beside those camels that the men are watering who are trying to do the same thing? Is that a question? Yeah, it's a question. <laughs> so, so I'm asking two things. I'm asking you, stop the label. What are we trying to do? And then, if we can understand that, can you seriously tell me that amongst the women who your educated friends are running back to the camels to go and marry, yeah. none of them are doing that work. Yeah. I want, to, I, that's what I want to understand. <laughs> you brought it on yourself. <laughs> hey, no, don't, don't you do that. Yes. He, he may have camels, you all have got the cows or whatever. No, no, no. <laughs> The, the, the place is too dense for camels to walk in his country. Um, no, I, look, I don't want to speak for all the camel herders. I, I just want to, I, I just want to make this clear. I, 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 I am really not schooled at camels. Uh, it's something that hopefully I'll, I'll pick up in the future. But just to say, I am, the question was feminism. And I was just telling you the word, what, word feminism, the, what, if you unpack it, of course. There are many people for fighting for their for equality. There are many women who are succeeding in many ways. There are many stories being told on small little conf uh, conflict in a positive sense that are ongoing and women get much more opportunities. I, I believe actually in the long run, uh, the, the challenge is do we want immediate change, which I think most of us want to, but then I remember a story. I, I don't know who those guys, if, if you, 
I'm not that old, but I'm saying, I remember reading Steve Biko's writing. Steve Biko, the South, the South African freedom fighter, he, 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 he had a really big problem with liberals, white liberals. He used to say, I, can, I cannot stand white liberals. I'd rather deal with the right-wing white guys in South, Southern Africa. Because the white liberals tell you, change will come. Don't wait. It will happen. Don't do too many terrorist attacks. Don't fight. Don't, don't go out there. It will happen. But he says, yeah, you can say that because you have a privilege. You, 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 you live that life. I can't wait. So it's the same situation with men and women in the context of women being marginalized. When you talk to reasonable, even reasonable men, you tell them, you know, do you all believe that women should have more rights? Do you all believe that, if you are putting the feminist thing aside, do we, have, do we believe that uh, women should have equal opportunity for education? Do you think women should? If you ask those questions, they always, no, 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 no. Nobody will say, I'm against it. There are some who said, I'm talking about reasonable people. I'm not talking about unreasonable ones. So, if, but then they will say, you know, but we need to be gradual. Of course we need to be gradual because it, you, you don't have to worry about it. But, and that is, I think, the, for me, if I had to re rephrase it, that is the biggest challenge. The, the forces of change and equality are gaining momentum, but within them, those who are gradualists, who are more conservative gradualists, who will say, if we go full throttle and we ask for rights, that may be problematic. So the Kamal Haidas will have problem with the overall, uh, you know, overnight change. But another thing that I always observe, I don't want to speak for Liberia, although I've lived there and it's a wonderful country, by the way. Lima, because you're here. If you're not here, it would have been a different story with Sam and I. But, uh, but it, it, on a serious uh, note related uh, to, uh, to the issue of gradualism and non-gradualism and how that is achieved, I think that is something that I don't uh, uh, see being discussed. It may be discussed in different, uh, different ways. But if that is dealt with and, uh, and how that is achieved, and I hope that this discussion, hopefully before it finishes, will lead into what what kind of small changes that can, can, can be implemented. And I answer your question, I don't want to give a picture that the Kamal Haders are not discussing these things. And there are many small winnings that are going on for women's advance, advancement. So my argument was just that if you put the complete uh, understanding of feminism, which most of people don't understand, those of us who are privileged, and then you unbreak it, then I think many people are agreeable to that. So that's what I was trying to, to put through. Well, thank you. I, Did on I the subject that? of, well, I, I don't want to turn this into a conversation between me and you. So I want now to ask everybody here, I know a lot of people have got burning questions. Perhaps we can begin with the last one that you, um, anybody here got something they think needs to be done that they would like to ask the men how they do it? Or any other question that they feel? You, you've got this great opportunity of these self-identified, we are not afraid of the F word men, who in their personal lives have given stories of how they are prepared to be on the cutting edge. So please give them something to cut. Hi, my name is Purity, I'm from Kenya. Um, I was wondering, what are you doing to ensure that there are more men like you? Because we really know <laughs> there are few of them. <laughs> That's a good question. And I'm happy you're from Kenya. <laughs> and uh, we, are, we are working on that because we realize that we have to work with men. And we have to be the examples. And for example, what I did, as I, as I can share, coming from the, you know Kibera very well, you know? As a man, you know, I was getting what people were gonna fight back to me. I was taking risk. I built a school for girls in my community. And then, what I did was important was, we did important was that, we took even the toughest men who think they are tough to listen to women and start joining women movements in the slum. And right now, in my community, rape cases has gone down because we work, we work with the community, you know what I mean? So, and I think we, the, this one problem that we have to work on is that we, Africa has to get, so we have to really have to give them credit. We have, I know, women presidents. 
But the issue we're going to face in Africa is that when the election come, we may lose these women. So we have to work hard on that. Why? There is something called elite in this African country. That doesn't trickle down. It's about small events, people drink wine, and they are few. And therefore, the message is not being passed down. So as we, as eh, men who are trying to be good, eh, as we are working together with you guys, let's all of you be champions. Go to the grassroots, go to the village. It's not only about on the air. Because in that way, we don't have a big change. Thank you. Sarah Moa, I'm afraid. Auntie Abina, I'm really having fun watching your panel. They are like school children, afraid of the headmistress. I, I really am having fun watching their facial expression. But there are two experiences in my life, and since we're talking to men, oh, good. There's a lot of worry around the young men um, perception of the women's body. And three, actually. One was Abby telling me about a TED talk she wanted to, she wants to give about why little boys in this country at age 10, 11, 12 will only look at porn on their iPhones. That's the first one. The second one was years ago, working with child soldiers and talking to one of them, and he's telling me he never raped anyone. And the question was, did you force anyone to have sex? Oh, yes. Isn't that what the woman's body was made for? Going back to my 12-year-old in school in Ghana, going to her class and shouting, happy International Women's Day to all the girls in the house. And a little boy, 12 years old, says, sit down and shut up. What are women good for? for giving birth to babies. How can these good African men help to change the mindset of young men, especially now that we have a lot of women mentoring women, what can they do with young African men to change that mindset? Because our bodies really do not begin from our breast to our vagina. We have brains and other parts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. And you know, I, I'm going to ask all three of you to address it. And I don't want to deflect away from the body, but when Lema said those three words, sit down and shut up, something happened to me. Because that attitude spreads. You know the last person who said that to me? was a man in my own family, my mother's patriarchal family, when we were trying to organize her funeral. I'm my mother's eldest girl. My sister and I looked after our mother until the day she died. And we are organizing her funeral, trying to do, put in place what our mother had wanted. And this man, who is younger than me, but a chief in my patriarchal family, tells me to sit down and shut up, I'm only the daughter. And this was only four years ago, I wasn't a child. I was a 57 year old woman. So please, <laughs> the question about how do we translate your lessons that you clearly as individuals have had to a different concept in the culture about where and when we enter and what our, how our bodies should be regarded and treated. Our literal and conceptual bodies. <laughs> wow, Lema. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very hard question, but I will try. So, there's something uh, about it, and uh, no matter how, you can think about it in different angles. One example is that as a, as a, as a man in the community, in, in Kibera, I can work with a shot up to here, and it will be like it's normal. I can even walk with my shirt, with no shirt, bare shirt, and just walk around, and it's accepted. Good question. 
What is that that when even our sisters in communities wear miniskirt, we call them in Kenya, it becomes a big deal. When their body is start being kind of expressed, what is that about? And before I come, a new lemma will ask that question. I don't know why. I was just thinking about it. <laughs> and then the idea came is, I think, this, personally, I think in the community, it is much more to do with power. It is power. It is expression. It is freedom. Therefore, a male will come and say, look at you. Who are you? Who the hell you are? You think you are? That's why you are being raped. No, that's not the truth. You know, it's about power. So women in this society is <laughs> when <laughs> so what's happening is that um, I love Wangari Madai. I want to give you a quick example. So when Wangari Madai was fighting for environment, and I remember I was a little boy, and I, people were like, Wangari was crazy. Police could not arrest Wangari Madai because Wangari Madai knew the power. Every time they were coming, women were like undressing, and the police were running away. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's something about it. I think it's more about being denied the freedom. Therefore, you're not supposed to be like that. You know what I mean? So for me, I kind of relate to much more to do with the, the it's a power relation thing. Like you have been put down, you don't need to stand up. You don't, need, you, don't, you don't have that freedom to express yourself. I mean, to the question, what can we do? Uh, that, at least in my experience, what we have tried to do both in our personal and in our public professional lives is one, first and foremost, as much as is possible, uh, to push ourselves to lead uh, by example, by, by living what we believe and value about humanity. Uh, that I have, in my, in my life, growing up, I have consistently told myself that there is nothing that has value more, that, is, that has the sanctity more than humanity. And, and this is why I find myself in, in, in this field. So it is not a man uh, protecting man's body or woman's body, but valuing, respecting, honoring the human person. It's important, and that, that's, that's fundamental. And communicating that through form of socialization, how do we educate our children? How do we mentor young people? I, I had a, a number of years when I was in, in Liberia establish sort of a mentoring program across the country uh, that is called the Palava Management Program, bringing young boys and young girls, finding scholarships, working with them on nonviolent processes and education, and many of them find themselves in prominent positions now, uh, both in this country and back, back home. Honoring humanity has, has got to transcend the objectification of other men or of women. And each one of us, whether it's men or women, sitting in this room should have that core value to drive the way you engage and interact with any other person in this world. That, for me, is, uh, is, is fundamental. The second thing that, that, that is critical is, I agree with uh, Lehman's uh, foundation in, in Liberia and many other young people setting up systems, is for us to then commit time, like he has been doing in Kibera, to work with other men, to educate other boys, to spend some time in socialization and educational processes, whether it's in schools or whether it's in community clubs, that sort of thing that I personally invest some time in could be something that other men across could also translate. We should, for me, fundamental, we should commit ourselves to not, because men are also objectified these days, not to the extent that women are objective. Every man should have three parts and have, uh, you know, or six parts, is it six or some <laughs> stuff like that, and they have to take pictures or whatever. So that objectification of the human person is becoming pervasive. It's something that requires us taking intentional action in the way we engage in our professional life, in the way we educate our boys, in the way we educate those that we are, that's, that look to us as role model. Uh, my, uh, 
I think my, my perspective of this is, and I agree with my colleagues on this, uh, is that most of discrimination is anchored in culture. But culture is not something that is rigid. We all know. Culture changes, acceptance changes. I, you look at this country now, that there's more acceptance that has that ever been on, on the rights of, of gay people than, than ever, uh, historic at least. Uh, but how change comes about? We men, many, most of us may not join. Let's be frank here, most of us may not join the campaign for equality uh, 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 for women. But you don't need more, so change never, ne change never comes by everybody being involved. Change comes because few people take risks. Few people go out there, few people uh, uh, accept the risk that comes with change. But from a, for men's perspective, I think for those who want to do good, the, 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 what I will uh, ask them if I had the opportunity and, uh, uh, is don't let small little things slide in daily language, especially uh, thing, uh, what you mentioned about uh, how, uh, how women's bodies are exposed in, in, in popular culture and how, it's, 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 uh, how women are objectified. If you don't let small little things slide, small little, of, because that's how things become obvious in a negative form. If, if in our daily language, if our engagement with our brothers, our engagement with our friends, we challenge every little uh, usage of language that, uh, that puts women in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a disadvantage or reinforces their disadvantaged position, then I, I don't think you're, you're doing justice. Of course, most people don't like confrontation. Most people don't like to stop a flowing speech. You're in a bar with your friends, someone starts a speech, and you really don't want to be the one who puts cold water, as they say, in something that sounds interesting uh, among men. But I think change always comes by you know, doing your all small part. All of us are different. We're in a different uh, position in life. All of us have different powers, all of us. But all of us have an opportunity to bring change, however small. Not all of us are lemurs. But in a small way, we can be little lemurs doing our own little changes in our own home, in our own, with, our own, on, or with our own friends. And that also contributes. I think that's what I will, I will, I will uh, say. There's, oh, the, just to uh, finalize, there's over-reliance on law, I feel. And, and I think in, in societies where the government cannot build a street, it will not reinforce uh, equality through law. It's good to have laws, but I think it's through culture, it's through the household, it's through exposure, it's, that's where change comes. Among those men who are afraid of feminism, do you think that um, they see the power of women? Women are very resourceful, and I'm wondering if there's a fear that not only um, will they become equal, but they will turn the tables. You know, there's that throwaway line in that Phyllis song about women are going to want to dance the, the fire dance. Is there a fear that women will completely turn the tables and become more powerful than men um, uh, if they're allowed more access in the political and economic processes? Um, hi, my name is Devine Ragjimana. I founded an organization for young Africans. And I know Kennedy because I spoke, you know, I heard you speak at one of the events you came in last year. but. My, mess, my question is, how do we continue having this conversation, especially for young men? What is the message for young men to continue? Because I think that if we can have, we can start having conversations with young people, young girls, young men, then by the time they get to be your age, then it's not so hard to comprehend that they need to respect women, they need to be included in the conversation. So my question is, what's the message to young men? Are men scared? Okay, what, what, what I think is that, as Mohamed said, there's no good PR on the word F, <laughs> okay? So a little bit sometimes can sound scary to some men. So that, but yeah, uh, which is true. When you're in your own comfort zone, you don't want to let it go. That's, that's, the human, that's humanity, you know what I mean? That's the way human heart, but we can change that, you know. So I think by doing what? By having conversations going on, you know, and having a good PR, how you're going to present yourself so people can see what you really stand for. And to my sister, the other side is that 
you know, you know what really changed people is not something complicated. You know what I mean? Think about it. I was touched by being told to wash dishes. And I want to know, mom, why? Because society has been telling me that you don't need to wash dishes. You know what I mean? So I think in our houses, in, Af in African communities, we can start having these talks. You know what I mean? We can start talking to our friends, in the families. The problem in Africa that we are facing is one thing. Accountability. <laughs> we don't ask questions. It's a taboo. Don't talk about that in the, in the, with your family. You are not allowed to question. You know what I mean? And therefore, if you're not allowed to question, people are going to look for just justifications. One of them in the Bible says that women are, you know what I mean? So that's what's being used in most of the society because there's no <laughs> accountability, you know. So I think we should start talking about these things and try to make it much more grassroots. Can you um, get the young boys to have a different mindset about the role of women in society and in their families if the laws are the way they are and the religions are the way they are? This is not really a question. It's uh, just uh, more like a supporting statement and with regards to recognizing the rights of women. And I've been someone who has lived and partnered with a true woman's activist. I don't call her feminist, I call her partner. I don't think we should be calling women feminists. I think we should be calling them partners. Because I think they do partners with us. I think it's important that we recognize the essence of that partnership. Because even in the Bible, Adam had a partner, Eve, and they were there to do the right things. And God told them exactly what to do so that we, they could achieve or enjoy the benefit of the garden. And I think it is important for men to be part of most of these women's forum. I think it's important to bring a lot of men, invite a lot of men so they can recognize and appreciate the importance of women being equal. You know, it's, African men, it's going to be quite difficult to appreciate that. But the more we bring them to the table, the more we bring them to the forum, so that they understand the difficulties women are having in Africa or around the world. If they can understand that, I think they will appreciate that and ensure that women can be on equal level with men. I, I, on, the, on the religion side, because I want to be able to go back home, and I think this has been recorded. No, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to touch that too much. But just to say, the power of example is extremely important, especially for conservative societies. The more we have women leaders, the more we have women presidents, and then people know that the sky hasn't fallen, uh, the country hasn't collapsed, and women are as incompetent as men in many ways in leadership. So everybody can... So I, 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 think, I think the more... Uh, the power of example is, is shown. Women take up a more leadership position, and, uh, and, and people see that as, as, as an important element. I think these fears will decrease. Really, I, 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 I always see it in my society. Whenever I go back, the level of tolerance, the level of, 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 of acceptance is increasing. It's not going as fast as we want, but if I remember 15 years ago, I, I grew up in a small town in the uh, coastal part of Kenya, which is uh, an Islamic religious place. The more I go back, the changes you see in terms of acceptance is really improving. But it, not, not fast enough for sure. But I, so for me, the power of examples. If this country ends up having a woman president, if other countries have women leaders, and, and I think that in itself will, will, 
will reduce the fear component. Religion is used, uh, I, I can tell you from, the, uh, from, from an Islamic perspective, most, uh, I, I think most Islamic countries or Islamic population don't speak Arabic, right? And you're reading a book that is written in old Shakespeare type English Arabic. <laughs> so the level of understanding is extremely, extremely uh, 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 limited. So it's someone just going, oh, I went to the mosque and someone said this and I want that. And, and then people who have power, people who are in power of privilege are very selective in which line they use to impose their order. You know, you go to many Islamic societies where uh, people don't talk about homosexuality, but is homo homosexuality is there, is open, is, is rampant, but you don't see the same hostility towards it, except in Uganda, which is not an Islamic country. But uh, uh, the same hostility you see is not, is not the same hostility for women's rights. It's very interesting. You go to this other country, the hostility for women's rights to give women simple things like the, the, the ability to drive, which I never understood what is the link between driving and, 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 and the kind of uh, 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 whether you're a man or a woman aspect of it. So it's, it's a huge, huge diversity that exists. There's this, uh, I don't know what to call it, but because I think you, you people who work in more in this area will know, but this extreme, I don't, I don't know, hatred is the last word, but it's, it's, it, it's really, really weird <laughs> that someone will spend all their energy just to make sure that someone else, other, another human being, doesn't have one centimeter of progress in their life. And that, is, that needs a, a PhD student to study these things. Probably this is the right forum. Yeah, I think it's, it's all been well said. The, again, the emphasis that every, all of us are laying here is we, we need to seize the space for re-socializing our homes, our communities, the schools we're working, the friends we have. That fear dissipates when, when you know, frequent confrontation, engagement, encounters take place, then it, it, that's the how it works. And, and I think all of us have some responsibility to that as well. Uh, Kent's mother did the re-socialization for him. She made him to wash dishes. My sisters bullied me and reminded me that they too were equal to men. And so the process requires women and men, and that's what uh, Kesley had said, women and men's partnership. We need to work together. You don't need to see us as the enemy of this change. And we don't need to be afraid of your agitation for this change. That encounter, in my view, is not going fast enough. And I'll put the challenge back, back to, to women's movement. Invite us in. I mean, Lehman had taken the courage to bring us here. Do, do more of those. Let's talk together. Dialogue is where transformation happens. And if you exclude us, we all will not achieve the change, the, you know, the humanity that we want to redeem through this whole exercise, including your humanity and our humanity that is also in shackle of fear. Thank you. <laughs> um, as we said at the end of the last panel, this is only the tip of the iceberg. I apologize to you. Those of you who didn't get a chance to ask questions, I hope you'll come back for the afternoon. My takeaway is that we must remember that, you know, liberation is not a, freedom is not a zero-sum game. And we're all human beings walking this earth together. And we need to find a way to do it without fear. Thank you for coming to share your experiences. You'll hear from us.